Welcome to this last keynote lecture of, uh, of, the, of this last edition of the conference. The conference is getting to an end and we have the pleasure of uh, having Frank Cowell, the current president-elect, to, uh, to have the keynote, the keynote lecture. Uh, if you allow me a personal note, it's actually a, a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, introduce Frank today, as he was my external examiner some 20 years ago. Uh, so, Frank, it's a great, uh, it's a, it's a great coincidence, uh, a great thing that, uh, that I, I have the opportunity to, to introduce you today after so little time has uh, gone by. Frank is a um, professor of economics at uh, London School of Economics, and uh, as you know, the president-elect of our, of our society. Uh, since we're running late, and given his contributions to the field of economic inequality, I think that there is no much need to introduce all his merits and, uh, and virtues. So let me be, let me be short here. Um, Frank's published hundreds and more papers in, uh, in the discipline, all of them related to uh, inequality issues and several books. He's, he has worked extensively on economic inequality, where he's got seminal theoretical contributions on inequality measurement that I'm sure a, a, a large share of us have used in our, in our research, theoretical or, uh, or applied with data. Has pioneered the experimental, what he called the experimental questionnaire approach to examine people's views about the building blocks of many distributional concepts, such as inequality, poverty, mobility, or polarization, that I know for certain had upset some of the actors in, this, uh, in these fields, um, and has also contributed uh, on empirical um, analysis, so he has put his hands on the data and taking all these theoretical contributions to the data. So as you see, he has played all keys. He has contributed to the uh, theoretical literature, to the experimental questionnaire literature, and uh, to the empirical, to the empirical literature. He has also contributed to uh, different subfields in, in economic inequality, such as tax evasion, statistical robustness of distributional measures, and uh, more recently, inequality measurement with ordinal data and wealth inequality. Perhaps his uh, most um, well-known book is measuring, uh, sorry, inequality measurement, which is now 40 years old, is uh, of course a mass read for everyone who wants to start understanding how one should measure uh, economic inequality, and is already in the third edition. Among his academic services to the profession, Frank has served as uh, editor of the Journal of Public Economics, also in Economica, and as you may know, he is currently the editor of the Journal of Economic Inequality, the uh, journal, as Janet said in the, uh, in the welcome, uh, session, the official journal of the, uh, of the society. Today, Frank is going to speak about inheritance, inequality, and the idle rich. Many of them around here? I don't think so. So the floor is yours, Frank. Thanks very much. Well, uh, <laughs> certainly want to thank my friend Xavi and a couple of other friends. Uh, first of all, I must mention Dirk van der Haar, who uh, has worked with me on the background paper for this, uh, which has recently been completed. And Dirk's been very generous in allowing me to uh, present this as all my own work, but it isn't. Um, and there, indirectly, I should thank my friend and uh, colleague, uh, Stephen Jenkins, who gave me the cheeky idea for the title. Many years ago, Stephen uh, co-authored a lovely little paper called The Three Eyes of Poverty. And now we have The Three Eyes of the Rich. So, let's see where we're going with this. 
uh, the thing that we're going to look at is rooted completely in the uh, what you might call a standard economics literature. But what I wanted to do was to reach out a bit to those of us who are in th those here in the audience who aren't by nature or by discipline economists, because I think the ideas here can be communicated to uh, quite a wide audience. So, um, what's interesting is that uh, part of this I knew, obviously, reviewing the papers uh, before this uh, conference, uh, the, num the amount of interest that's in the topics that are going to be touched on in this, uh, in this presentation, uh, dealing with such things as uh, wealth distribution, uh, dealing with inheritance, and we've had uh, many of these things highlighted to us, the uh, peculiar shape of the wealth distribution. Um, if a visitor from Mars came down and looked at uh, society, think, well, how come society looks like this in terms of the wealth uh, inequality? And clearly, uh, we could provide such a visitor with uh, a variety of uh, interesting answers. And uh, so depending on when he arrived, he might find, well, there's a stable wealth distribution if it was a few decades ago, uh, something a bit different perhaps today. One of the things that I want to uh, touch on uh, is the role of uh, various groups in society, and if we were just going to sketch a list of those that might be relevant, we might mention those that I put on the screen there. And I want to touch on a couple of key themes, uh, which indeed, though I didn't know this in advance, we didn't see the talk in advance, were touched on by Joe Stiglitz uh, just a little while ago this afternoon. So here are the two uh, main themes, which are slightly different from the way he put them, but nevertheless, you'll see the echoes in there. So, in the forces that generate the wealth distribution, you can identify what we might call forces of division, and the key thing that I'm going to focus on here is inheritance. We might ask, well, is there equal inheritance amongst inheritors or some kind of favoritism, this kind of thing? And forces of union People get together with other people, they marry. They're, apart from all the other interesting things that happen, the wealth gets you, uh, united, perhaps, gets passed on, to, uh, passed on to others. And again, we might want to ask ourselves on what basis, to, economic basis, does this kind of marriage take place? So we'll see those uh, themes developed in the talk here this afternoon. So let me just do a little bit of background uh, setting we're focusing principally on economics as an explanation. And some of these uh, topics that we'll deal with, economics does very well. Others, perhaps, rather less well, where economics needs to rec re recognize its limits. So when we're thinking about concern for others, yes, we've got economic theories about that. Thinking about economics of the family, social norms, and so on. Uh, yes, of course, we've got a lot of economics on that too, but I feel that economists should be uh, a little bit humble in, in terms of saying how much we can say so that I'm not pretending to follow all of the standard economic explanations alone with what I need to touch on these things. Second area that we need to talk about are the people that are involved. So uh, we've got... Uh, sometimes we need to focus on individuals. We will talk about families and dynasties here uh, because we're looking at uh, the intergenerational development of the, uh, of the wealth distribution. We need to think about the role of uh, society and ultimately we need to look at the role of the state and sometimes when we think of the role of the state in wealth distribution, we just think in a rather narrow way. We think of uh, uh, the state as a policymaker when it comes to talking about taxes. But maybe there are a couple of other things here and here we ought to think about as well, which we'll get onto towards the end of the talk. A rather technical point that we need to touch on since we're talking about the development of the wealth distribution, is the issue of time. Um, and when I talk to people about uh, wealth distribution, I point out that wealth distribution, it seems to me, is a necessarily difficult problem. 
You know, there are lots of problems in economics which are unnecessarily difficult. In other words, the ideas are simple, and uh, it's just the economists sort of make them interesting by making it more complicated. But things can get complicated because, as far as time is concerned, we need to. We've got these sort of two aspects of time going on at the same uh, at the same moment. We've got inter intragenerational and intergenerational issues here. Here, uh, we're focusing principal, principally on the intergenerational issue. And in our paper, uh, the one with Dirk, uh, we uh, use as a subtitle, Wealth Cascading from Generation to Generation. I doubt whether there's many here who would recognize that quotation. It uh, comes from a Tory prime minister in the UK. Now, Tory prime ministers, I think, don't have a very good press right at the moment, but this guy was particularly interesting. It was John Major about a quarter of a century ago, and he was thinking through and trying to present to the Conservative Party issues concerning inheritance and taxation. And he had this kind of vision about what was involved, the kind of economic issues that were involved, uh, which I think quite nicely captures the theme of what we're going to talk about here. I want to talk about uh, equilibrium analysis, again, a topic that's also been referred to uh, in uh, the talk that we had earlier on today. So let's just deal with what we're talking about in this case, to, uh, in this context about equilibrium. So what I want you to uh, imagine that at any moment T, we've got some, where T is just indexing the generations here, we've got a distribution of wealth. Uh, which has its usual interpretation like that, so f of t. And there's some processes going on in society. There are processes going on from the market, there could, which we might characterize as economic. There are lots of uh, inherently non-economic processes, um, although economists have got a theory of marriage and a theory of this and a theory of that. I'm pretty sure that people get on with their family life and with many issues here that have nothing to do with economics. So there are a bunch of these processes. And all I want to suggest is that we've got this process P, which takes us from one generation to the next. And we can argue about what goes into P uh, as much as we like. So that you can imagine a little sketch, such as we've got there, that there's this process P that takes you from last generation to this generation. And what we want to do is ask ourselves, is there a particular distribution of wealth F star, such that P, when you apply that to the distribution, simply replicates it. If so, that's what we mean, that F star, by an equilibrium distribution. It's a key concept with what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. So I said it's going to be rooted in uh, economics. Let's just talk about the decision-making that's involved here. We've got a standard model of allocating resources, a standard budget constraints and uh, standard model of bequests with one little twist that turns out to be really important. And it's kind of surprising that in the standard models that are around in the literature that this isn't uh, normally there. We've got, as we said, the forces of union, marriage here. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. Oh, and we need to talk about children. Children are essential to what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Now, in previous presentations at this, uh, uh, at this conference and uh, reviewing the literature as we did when uh, Dirk and I were writing the paper, we were kind of surprised at what little role children play in bequest models and inheritance models. Um, you know, sometimes they're sort of put in as a kind of afterthought that... Uh, Every family has two children, not 2.4 children, but we've got integer children in here. And clearly there are models such as uh, a very interesting presentation on the first day of the conference where uh, we've got very carefully planned fertility, this kind of thing. But for many people, children just come along or they don't come along. And um, this is going to play a key role in what we're going to talk about. So what kind, I always think it's a good idea to talk about the constraints before you start talking about the objectives. So I want you to imagine that in any one generation, so a generation just consists of a complete time unit, 
Uh, there's the earnings E over that uh, generation, and there's inheritance. And the total wealth that that generation's got available is not given, being given by the sum of those. Uh, now, clearly, we've got uh, the obvious constraint that earnings can't be negative, and we suppose that this thing here is that there's some upper bound on your earnings, giving the talent. So in other words, E bar is what you could conceivably earn if uh, 365 days a year and uh, all the rest of it, you spent all your time earning as much as you could. We suppose that there are forces out in society where if you just leave the, leave the wealth to itself, the wealth grows. So we've not got sort of complicated stuff in here about uh, differential rates of return and uh, all that kind of thing with different assets and so on. So in principle, you could pass on um, a total amount of 1 plus G times W to the next generation. But, of course, that's not going to happen because uh, basically what people will do is choose rationally how much they're going to pass on. And, in principle, you've got a, a little budget constraint that looks like that. So B bequests, C consumption, and W is total wealth. Now, let's talk about preferences. First of all, in a very general way, and then very specifically, uh, and I've made a, a deliberate decision here, I want to come down to a very specific representation of preferences. So the basic issue, which I guess affects everyone in every society around the world, is well, what are we going to leave the kids, and how long do we go on working, how much do we work? Um, and the twist in this model is that preferences are over three things, not two things. I mean, there are lots of these um, bequest models where there are two things involved. There's the, the B, the bequests, and there's the C, your own consumption. Here there's the additional thing. There's leisure. You want to work yourself into the ground. And leisure is, in effect, this thing here. You say, well... Uh, What's the proportion of my total life that I spend earning? Okay, so there's my actual earnings the top, on the top line, this thing, and divide it by E bar. One minus e, e, um, e over E bar is the proportion of your life that you spend in leisure. So we've got a little BCE utility function for these things. B for the bequest, C for consumption, E for your earnings, which is basically the opposite of leisure. And let's just keep it as simple as possible so that everyone knows there are no tricks involved here. This goes right back to Becker and Tomes probably earlier on. We've got a Cobb-Douglas utility function. So uh, there's my Cobb-Douglas utility function. We've got uh, um, gamma and 1 minus gamma, the coefficients on uh, log bequests and uh, log consumption. And we've got a little thingy added on there for leisure as well. Now... I'm not going to bore you with uh, working through the details of this, but the outcome of it is interesting to note because this is common to a lot of standard uh, economic models of bequests. Um, what will happen is that consumption turns out to be proportionate to wealth. That's the consumption over the lifetime. Or put it the other way around, the savings rate is going to be gamma. Um, and it also implies this, that in principle, there could be two regimes on earnings, coming back to the title of the talk. So you could have positive earnings, in which case they're given by the right-hand item in that uh, uh, thing with the braces, or you could be in the happy position of not having to work. You've got enough stuff. You don't have to do it. It also makes clear that you've got a kind of linear relationship between earnings and wealth. The richer you are, the less you need to work. You go off and do other things. You sail your yacht. You play golf. You become president of the United States, or whatever it is. Um, it's this kind of thing. So, so basically, earnings are going to look like this. So earnings are a function of wealth. And the higher your wealth is, the less you're likely to work, given the particular set of preferences. So that if we were looking at this in terms of a little picture. So here we've got wealth along the horizontal axis and earnings on the vertical axis. And that first 
thing that I've uh, marked on the horizontal axis, uh, basically that's where um, inheritance is zero because you've still got some wealth any, anyway because of the, um, the, the earnings that you accumulate over the lifetime. So that in fact you've got this kind of piecewise linear thing like so. Now if you want to imagine what kind of world we've got here, we've got a world that's already consisting of two classes. Strivers on the left, the guys who work, the idle rich on the right-hand side. Now, I don't know whether anybody here, they probably don't share my rather peculiar tastes for the novels of P.G. Woodhouse. Because basically, those of you who do know that will know that it's populated with young men who have enough inherited wealth. They really don't have, they shouldn't have any cares in the world. They, they do have cares in the world. Uh, but there are some, basically, who don't quite make it. And if necessary, they realize they're here and they've got to work. Okay? But basically, if you're rich enough, you don't work. So, some standard questions that we want to ask about this model that we're going to address, how the dynamics of wealth work here. Um, we want to understand... Um, how inequality works in the short run and in equilibrium, and also how these two regimes sort of interconnect. We're also going to see um, how uh, the implementation of the model actually works. Okay, let me go on to what Dirk and I call the basic model. And the value of the basic model is not that it's a terribly good representation of the world as we know it. But it is the simplest caricature, we would argue, of the world as we know it. And it teaches us a lot because the truths of the basic model come through in the more interesting models. Um, so it's based on this, what we call this little BCE uh, preference model where we've got bequest, consumption, and earnings. Um, and in our basic model, we assume a sort of mating so everybody marries uh, people who look just like themselves in terms of their wealth. When the kids come along, the kids get equal share in the parental wealth. And we assume a stationary population. None of those assumptions is necessary for the uh, general results that we've got. It just makes it easy to see what's going on here. So you can see very clearly what drives the equilibrium, um, whether there is an equilibrium indeed, and what the role of the individual parameters are uh, that's in this. Okay, so let's talk about the elements of the model. Uh, this is just recapping on what we did just a few moments ago in the slides. So consumption proportional to wealth, uh, bequests uh, also proportional to wealth. Um, the additional thing that we've got in here is that uh, by the time you get to the end of the period, uh, things have grown a bit. Uh, so we've got this growth factor, which is convenient to write as uh, one plus the actual growth times the savings rate, right? So pause for just reflection on the notation because sometimes with these talks you get so much notation thrown that you forget. Beta's important, right? Forget all the other stuff. Beta's really important. Um, so we've got in our basic model wealth of the woman exactly equal to the wealth of the man. And we've got equal division of bequests. So even if you're not heavily into some of the more formal models, I think this is okay for all of us. Basically, uh, what we're saying here is, look, if you've got K kids, yeah, and we've got uh, each of the two marriage partners leaves a, a equal bequest of uh, B, T minus one, so there's two, there are two parents, so that explains the two, you divide it by K, I on the left, I of T, is what they get from the inheritance, okay? And here's the formal uh, assumption about the structure of the population. Just um, let me just say a word about PK here. This is simply the proportion of families with K kids, okay? So that's something that's absent, I think, from almost all models. It's just looking at the, any moment in society you've got people with lots of kids, people with one kid or whatever. So what we need to do is just to see 
in a kind of intuitive way how this is working. Then we'll look at the formal thing. So you imagine. So we'll have two goes at just sketching this out. We've got uh, equal number of men, uh, equal number of women and men. Let's work from left to right. And woman I marries man J. They have equal wealth by assumption. So you add their wealth together, you end up with 2W. And I and J, by the time they're ready to pass on to the next generation, wealth's grown a bit, or it, it's changed by a factor beta. So beta is the, is the factor there. Um, there are two of them, so it's two times beta. And I and J, I don't know, let's just call them uh, Ivanka and Jared, okay? <laughs> they have three kids, all right? And <laughs> there we go. Two-thirds of the Ivanka Jared uh, uh, wealth goes to each of the three kids, we assume. We're never going to know, are we? Um, alternative story. Little emperor. So now we've got our women on the left and men on the right. And in this case, Peng Yi Wan marries Xi Jinping. Okay? And their wealth gets joined. They've got equal wealth. We'll never know exactly how much they've got. And their wealth at the end is 2 beta W. And they have, in their case, one little empress. Okay? She gets everything. So I'm now going to introduce you to a dystopian world just to see how this works, to see how inequality gets generated. So in that little diagram at the top, we've got wealth measured left to right. And we start out at a situation of primordial equality. Everyone's got W0. And we have got the strangest society. You know, this is a nightmare that you're going to relive if you overeat tonight. Society consists of the Xi family and the Krishna family, OK? Uh, basically, everybody has either one kid or three, just for my little example. And there's equal probability. So that when you let the generations go along, there's t equals 1. Uh, that distribution that was represented by a single bar at the top now becomes 2, because you know, some people have one child, some people have three. And then t equals 2. And you can see where it's going. You can see how the inequality starts. OK. Let's now introduce a little bit more formally what we mean by the idle rich. In fact, we're going to look at a subset of the idle rich. Um, and it's basically those who do no work, and their children will also choose to do no work. Now, this is the one bit of the mathematics that you need to follow to see where it comes from. It's not complicated. So imagine you're in a K family. A K family is uh, just a family with K kids. And you know, by assumption, your, your parents had equal wealth. So if you've got wealth W, given that you had two parents, and uh, altogether there were K of you, of the kids in the family, your parents must have had that. Okay? Therefore, by a quick leap of algebra, we can relate the distribution of wealth this generation, to what must have happened, to what was present there last generation. Okay. What we've got in here, the weights are half K because there are two parents, there are K kids, and PK is the proportion of the kids. And we add up over all the families from just size one child up to size K. By the way, in, there's a little fudge here. We assume that there's no family that has zero kids because we don't know what to do with the wealth. Right? But we don't have... Uh, nieces and nephews and complicated stuff in there. It would just make it too complicated. Okay, so for the idle rich, that is the basic formula of what's going on. Supposing we had the strivers, those who earn. Um, so again, we ask the same story. You've got wealth W, you come from a K family. There were, you had K minus one horrible little brothers and sisters. Um, and therefore, your parents must have had that. Okay, same reasoning as before. 
and the mechanics of the distributional change are exactly, well, they're almost exactly as what we had before. We just got to allow for the fact that we've got positive earnings in there, okay? And remember, the richer you are, the less you work. So there's the basic model of distributional change, what we had on the, on the previous screen. And now we just allow for the fact that people will endogenously choose E, depending on what inheritance they got. Notice that if we just said, hmm, in effect, we've got a kind of weighted average thing going on here. Yeah? So we've got this bit, a k, which is the half k, p sub k. We've got um, a bk bit in here, which uh, looks uh, like that. And we've got a little constant c for uh, e bar for the um, uh, strivers, the idle rich, c equals 0. So now let's look at the inequality generator once again. And here I've explicitly put in on the left-hand side of the diagram the, the strivers zone. We've got everybody there at um, W0. And so we go through the generations like so, like so, like so. And gradually we can see the inequality emerging as the distribution works its way through. And I just wonder if you can guess where we're going to end up here. So what we want to do is to see if we can find an equilibrium. So the basic model we've got, as I say, is this kind of um, this, this generation's distribution of wealth is a kind of weighted average of last year's generation, uh, last generation's um, distribution of wealth, or bits of that. And remind you of the definition of equilibrium. We're at equilibrium if f sub t equals f sub t minus 1, the functions, right? So basically, what we're looking for is an F star that fits in both sides of the equation. And basically, if uh, A, B, and C are constant, this has got to tr hold true for an arbitrary W. Now, if somebody had just walked in very late into the lecture and maths whiz and just saw this equation here, and he's a maths whiz, and he says, oh, what we've got here is a simple functional equation. I know how to solve that. Well, we'll come back to how you solve that in just a second. So let's just take it step by step. As far as the strivers are concerned, uh, what we do is we say, well, we've got uh, an equilibrium distribution that's going to be found from this, where C is a positive number. For the idle rich, it's actually much simpler. And the guy who's just walked in the back will say, I know exactly the solution to that functional equation. There's only one function f star, or class of functions f star, which satisfies. It's got to look like this, where um, a and b, sorry to confuse by reusing, uh, const by reusing labels here. These are just arbitrary constants. a, b, and c are constants. Sorry, I should have thought of other symbols. OK, let's talk a little bit about the nature of the equilibrium we discovered. First off, you remember we had the little diagram a few slides ago which showed you the two regimes uh, where you work, where you don't work, and there was a kind of a kink exactly at wealth W bar. Because if your wealth is above W bar, you don't work because you choose not to work. You're rich enough to do it all. And we will just refine that a bit by defining W double bar. And if wealth's above that level, you are in a special subset of the idle rich because not only do you not work, your kids don't work, or they will not work, they will choose not to work, nor did your parents work. You know, we've got people certainly in the UK and elsewhere who talk about... Uh, generation after generation of idleness, and they mean the poor. This is generation after generation of idleness, and we mean the rich, okay? So these are the seriously idle rich. So what I want to do is to suggest three regimes. We've just a slight 
um, teasing out what we had before. I uh, said before we got the strivers and the, and the idle rich. So for very low wealth, below W bar, you're a striver, and the striver rules apply. Um, let me just jump to three, because for three, where you're seriously wealthy, you are in that elite group of the idle rich, you know, basically from generation to generation. You know, last, year genera last generation and the future generation, you don't work. And then in the middle, you've got what we might call zone two here. You've got a transition zone where, for example, uh, husband and wife, they're both idle, but they then go and have a lot of kids. And the kids say, thank you, mum and dad, for having all these kids, because we've got to go out and work. Right, because we don't get enough inheritance once it's divided up between us. An important point to recognize here, in the equilibrium distribution, it's not a static distribution, there is mobility. So here's the kind of thing that can happen. Um, the particular story here depends on the value of beta, which is uh, the growth factor of, uh, of, of wealth once you take into account the underlying growth rate and the savings rate. So let's talk about somebody who starts just below W bar, so just in the striver zone. If in generation one, that family has one child, you jump up there, then the next generation, they have three children, they fall back down there, and they fall back down there. Okay? So there indeed can be mobility. Now, I don't know whether you've figured out where this is going as T goes off into the far blue yonder. Let's have a look. Supposing we started from a uniform distribution. So there's an approximation to a uniform distribution. On the vertical axis, we're uh, just looking at uh, frequency. You can imagine this as just a simple histogram approximation to a uniform distribution over uh, 5 to 15 of wealth. And we just let time roll on and see how it goes on. And this is what happens. You end up with a density function looking like that. And if we put it on a Pareto diagram, log of W versus log of 1 minus FW, it will look like that. So there's the, the dots represent the, what we did in the simulation. The red line is just simply uh, a suggested uh, theoretical line. Well, actually, you can compute what that is. Now, let me show you the really worrying one. Let's start. Let's start with situation that's, you know, recently there have been a few books that have come out which suggest the only thing that really guarantees uh, a reduction in inequality is a nice good war, okay? So uh, here you are in the post-apocalyptic world. Everybody's got the same wealth. And uh, by the way, we're still in this uh, crazy world where everyone's just got one child like the Xi family or three children like the Kushner family, okay? So we let it go on, 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 let it go on. On we go. And good grief. Just simply by allowing the normal processes of life to take place, people marrying, people having kids. So what do we end up with? We started out with perfect equality. We've got equal division amongst the kids, and we end up with a Pareto distribution. Now, a look at the dynamics of what's going on here. Uh, you can imagine that th this is a, there's a little important uh, point here to note. So imagine you've got two families. So uh, family one in uh, generation T minus one it's here, it has one child, and up it goes to this point here. Family two, with three children, start falling back a little bit like that. If they were to fall down into this zone here, the earning zone, the striver zone, this is why there's a kink exactly at W bar, means that the next generation will bounce back up a bit. Now, this is important. If that wasn't there, imagine what would happen if you've got reasonably large-sized families the inheritance keeps on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You think, well, oh, come on, that's not, not believable. Some um, social scientists looking at um, communities in Africa and elsewhere suggest this is very important. Because if all of your resources 
for feeding your family and so on come, let's say, from what you own in terms of a plot of land or something like that, and the plots get smaller and smaller, you end up in destitution. If you've got a labor market, as you see here, you bounce back. The next generation bounces back. Okay, so we were going to talk about equilibrium. Now let's have a look at equilibrium. As we saw from that diagram a moment ago, there may be no equilibrium because if beta's too high, basically in the next generation, because basically the, uh, uh, the wealth just uh, gets reflected off that line with slope um, uh, related to beta, and under those circumstances, you get this continued net growth of wealth, and basically the distribution that you've got in T minus 1 moves to the right in T, moves to the right in T plus 1, and you never get the self-reproducing distribution if beta's too high. And if we're in the special case where there's a stationary population, you've got to have this condition, beta less than 1 for an equilibrium. But of course, a stationary population is very special. So imagine there's a growth factor of the population, pi. So in other words, pi is 1 plus the population growth rate. The nice condition, which uh, I would like to recommend, or uh, my co-author, Dirk, and I would like to recommend to you for consideration, is that the crucial thing for equilibrium is that beta is less than pi in this model. Okay, let's have a look at the equilibrium. We do indeed have an equilibrium for the idle rich uh, because we're solving, this is what we saw before, this equation. It was on the previous screen. And as I say, if you're a mathematician, you know how to solve it. It has to take that form where A, B, and C are just arbitrary constants. And it's a Pareto distribution. So in this model, okay, we've only proved it so far for the basic model, or at least, no, no, no. In this lecture, we've only discussed it for the basic model. That's, that's a more accurate way of doing it. We know that the equilibrium distribution amongst one group of the population, don't forget we've now got three groups. We've got the strivers, we've got the really idle rich, and we've got those in the transition zone in between. So for the really idle rich, it must be, it must be a Pareto distribution. So you can start with whatever you like. You can start with perfect equality, and you end up with a Pareto distribution. And you can find out exactly the parameters of the Pareto distribution by saying, well, look, okay, we put F star in there, we put F star in there. Sorry, F star should be going in there. And basically, you find the parameter alpha from beta as the root of that equation. So, the implications are really quite profound of this because um, equilibrium inequality, those of you who know Pareto distribution, are determined by alpha because if we've got a pure Pareto distribution, the Gini coefficient is that, 1 over 2, minus, uh, two alpha minus 1. And within the context of this model, alpha is determined by beta which is basically what's going on in background. Now, the precise relationship depends on size distribution of families. And we could ask the question, well, you know, what happens in equilibrium two ways around? We could say, well, look, we know, or at least we can estimate what the savings and the growth rate of wealth is. What will equilibrium inequality be? Or with half an eye on the policy stuff that we're going to talk about at the end, we could say, well, if we've got a target level of inequality, what savings rate will permit it? Now, whilst you think about that, some of you here will be a little sketchy. Only very few will be sketchy on Pareto distributions, and others will know all about Pareto distributions, or you think so. Um, so... You also may be wondering, well, why were there these sort of odd little blobs when I ran the uh, simulation there? I have an example from real data. So, many of you will know, have worked in the field, that the Pareto distributions 
strangely crop up all over the place. So here's one. I'll tell you what E is in a moment. So we've got along the horizontal axis, this is the Pareto diagram as before, we've got log of E. And on the vertical axis, we're plotting log of 1 minus F of E. And as you can see, we've got this nice little range of data points. And there's this sort of, again, this odd thing that happens at the end there. And you think, well, is it really a straight line? Well, let me tell you what E is. It's the number of exclamation points in each tweet of President Donald J. Trump. <laughs> and there are the data. <laughs> oh, and the, there's, the, the, there's the fitted Pareto line with a, with, um, a value of alpha of 2.51, which if you do the computation means that you've got a Gini coefficient of 25% for Donald J. Trump's exclamation marks. This is something you probably didn't know and you certainly don't need to know it, but there you go. <laughs> Back to the plot. Right. So, one of the things that drives, we, what's interesting here is that the Pareto distribution doesn't come from just some sort of fanciful bit of data mining or from some rather arcane modeling of stochastic process. I mean, okay, kids are stochastic, but then kids are always stochastic, aren't they? Uh, that's, that's the only thing that's going on here. Um, what is clear is from this alpha-beta relationship is that the precise relationship depends on the P1, P2 up to PK, the, the, the size distribution of families. Let me give you a little example. So case one is our nightmare scenario. Everyone is either the Xi Jinping type family or the uh, Ivanka and Jared type family. So uh, you've got uh, either families with one kid or three kids and the average number is two kids. Case two, we've got a slightly more spread out a bunch of families, a vector of P like so. Case three, we've got even more spread out. And the key thing to notice is that because we've just retained the assumption that we've got stationary distribution, see, in the case of, in case two, we've got one, two, three, four different possible sizes of the family. In case three, you could have as many as six kids in the family. And in order to accommodate that, uh, to make sure that the expected number is still two, we've got to have a higher number of, um, uh, of, uh, families with size one, what the Chinese call the little emperor type family, because both parents devote all of their time, all of their resources to this one little kid who inherits everything. So we might think, well, how does this work then in terms of the equilibrium distribution? Because clearly we've got case three as a mean preserving spread of case two. Is this a dominance relationship that, um, is it this which drives inequality? Well, there's one very simple key factor which we can see. What we'll need to do is just say, well, what's the alpha-beta relationship? Don't forget, beta is what's happening to wealth, and alpha is the parameter that describes the, um, uh, it, well, it's the inverse of, loosely speaking, of inequality in the case of the uh, Pareto distribution. So we can solve that e messy equation we had earlier on for the alpha-beta relationship. And here we go. So um, case one, which was the, uh, this one here, is the uh, one that worked for our little example. Case uh, two is just to, uh, is uh, this one up here. And case three is this one here. Now, what's interesting is just look at the little emperors. In case one, proportional little emperors is 0.5. In case three, it's 0.35. In case two, it's 0.3. Um, if we did a more complicated uh, possible set of, it's always the little emperors that drive inequality. Hang on to that. We'll need to use it later when we come to a little historical example. Okay, so lessons we can do that. Basically, do we get an equilibrium? Depends on beta. 
size of beta. It also depends, so the size of beta basically depends on whether things don't drift off to the right. We don't want things to drift off to the left of the distribution, so you've got to have the striver zone, so that if you have the misfortune to be born into a large family, you don't get much inheritance, at least you can work your way out of it in the next generation. Um, we must have a Pareto distribution for the idle rich. And there is a key role for the family here because the distribution of families by size determines long-run uh, uh, inequality. And it's basically little emperor's rule, as they always do. So, you think, well, all of this, I've just done this for a, a rather artificial model. Uh, okay, I, I, didn't, I didn't need the, the nightmare scenario of just uh, the, the Kushners and the, and the Xi family. I mean, I can do it for an arbitrary population, but it is a stationary population. Uh, we have um, got equal division. We have got um, um, a s perfectly assorted mating. You might think, well, does this hold up elsewhere? So let's move on and think where we might go with this. So you say, well, just a second. This is where I try to get my retaliation in first with any questions. Yes, we've got equal division. Yes, we've got equal treatment of men and women. Maybe these things aren't, real, aren't uh, realistic. And you say, well, look, just a mo second. I know that in history there have been all sorts of other uh, inheritance rules, and there's certainly been gender bias in the past. Can we handle that? And dear, can I would respond, yes, we can. Um, so let me take you through a little model of what we might call unconventional inheritance. And we go way back in history for this one. Ancient Egypt and ancient Israel. You think, well, what do I know about ancient Egypt? Some of you who had to um, uh, do the uh, Hebrew scriptures when you were kids will know a little bit about ancient Israel. You possibly remember that Esau sold the right of firstborn to his younger brother Jacob. Basically, older sons got favored, not completely favored to the exclusion of everybody else, but typically it was um, sort of a double portion kind of thing. Interestingly, this also applies to my second example. My second example, here I should probably duck under the podium because here is an Englishman coming to talk to Americans uh, about the old good old days of the colonies, all right? <laughs> well, in the good old days of the colonies, and I have some examples here from Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Um, the law was, I can give you the reference afterwards if you want, that the eldest son gets a double share. Yeah, of course, we were to blame for it, but <laughs> there you go. So... You know, there are a variety of these other inheritance rules. How do we build this into our model? I'll show you, first of all, in a general way, which looks a bit daunting, and then, I think, in a much more appealing way. So, um, we're going to do two things. First of all, look at uh, unequal division just within one sex, one gender, and then differential treatment of men and women. So, the new thing that we do here is say, well, let's suppose we now can take on board any kind of inheritance rule that um, anthropologists have dug up from the past or the present and sort of remote tribes and different... You know, there are some very interesting examples here. So you've got primogeniture. Everybody thinks of, again, the sort of Bertie Worcester model of uh, traditional English family. But, you know, there are other models. In the Basque country, apparently, so I'm reliably informed, and people will tell me if I'm wrong, it used to be the case that the eldest child boy or girl would inherit the lot because they would look after the property. And very often it was the girl. So, you know, there are a variety of these things here. So uh, the key thing that we've done here is say, well, let's suppose that we um, have an explicit rule for child J and a family with K children, okay? In our earlier model, for all children, it was just one over K. That gets a bit complicated, as you'll see. So we've got a, 
a special case of this story, which looks a bit like uh, old colonial Massachusetts or ancient Egypt, take your pick, where one child is favored, and whereas everyone else gets an allocation of one, this child gets one plus chi. Okay? So in that case, we find that this um, uh, share is easily worked out. Let me just take you swiftly through the next slide, merely to give you the punchline at the bottom. Now we get a more complicated rule linking FT and FT minus 1. But it's basically the same story. You remember where we said, well, this is a constant AK. This is another constant in here. In the previous model, it was a, a BK. So it's a little bit more complicated now. Um, we need to solve for F star. And again, we get a Pareto distribution. It doesn't matter if you've got these weird things from ancient Egypt or the uh, uh, old colonial stuff. It works with one slight exception, which I will come to just now. Let's get rid of this sort of not very transparent approach here. Take the case where one kid is favored. It doesn't have to be the oldest kid. One kid is favored and gets the extra share, xi. Okay? Then you find, okay, the dynamic equation still looks a bit tedious. But look at the formula now for the idle rich reason. If Xi was zero, where there's no favoritism. Basically, the idle rich consists of that whole interview, in, interval, k w bar divided by 2 beta. K, big K is the maximum number of kids up to infinity. But now, the rule consists of K plus Xi. So you say well, to yourself, well, what would happen if we varied the amount of favoritism shown to the dreadful brat who's the favored kid. Hmm? So let's do it with a diagram. It's easy to work that way. We've got our three groups there, the strivers on the left, the idle rich on the right, the transition zone. And that uh, idle rich on the right basically corresponds, that zone there corresponds to that uh, uh, fancy W thing that I've got at that, that interval. So that's the idle rich on the right. So if you increase Xi, what happens is you increase the transition zone. And basically, the idle rich region, the region where the Pareto tail um, is applied, that shrinks. Or basically, you can think of the Pareto tail moving to the right. You still get a Pareto tail, but it starts further off to the right. Now what happens if you really get in, again, to do my reference back to um, the novels of P.G. Woodhouse. You've got Lord Emsworth who inherits the whole castle and, uh, you know, and it's his eldest son who gets the lot. You know? Can't stand his younger son. The, the younger sons get nothing. So what happens if Xi goes off to infinity? The transition zone goes off to infinity. And so in the very special case of pure primogeniture and you know, usually the younger kids were allowed something, the clothes they stand up in and a few other things as well. So pure primogeniture perhaps is a little bit fanciful. Uh, basically, uh, the model breaks down. Okay. So imagine what would happen. Favoritism in the US, shock horror. Uh, so here we've uh, simulated the uh, US um, distribution of population. And... Um, what we have uh, done is, for primogeniture, we've just assumed a large number so that the, uh, the first kid or the, the favored kid gets 10 times the share that any other kid gets, okay? Uh, and we've got equal division. So um, with equal division, this case here, you've got the, for any given beta, you've got the highest value of alpha. Don't forget, a higher value of alpha means a lower inequality, lower genie. Uh, if you've got old colonial habits, you're here. And if for some reason the place went mad and you went back to uh, primogeniture or you adopted other people's practice of primogeniture, you end up with serious inequality for any given uh, value of 
beta. So, time to move on to another kind of favoritism, gender bias. Now, this should be very familiar, even if you really don't consider yourself an economist, uh, even if you just wandered in by accident. You know, there we are, um, a single man in possession of a large fortune must be in want of a wife. Okay, so we know that in times past, uh, you know, you take the, the, the era of Jane Austen, um, there were some very peculiar inheritance rules. It's not quite as simple as one might suppose, uh, and certainly the way we're going to model it, but there were some very peculiar inheritance rules that distinguish between men and women. I don't want to try and model peculiar inheritance rules, but sort of simplify it down so we can reconcile it with the previous model. So now we've got a different kind of favoritism. If you're a boy, you get a premium, right? Um, the truth in advertising, it doesn't actually matter whether it's the boys who are favored or girls in this, but let's, let's suppose it's the boys who are favored. Okay, so you get zeta. So now what you get is in effect a two-population solution. So if there's equal division um, amongst the boys and amongst the girls, then you get a, a male distribution, looks like this, uh, where this thing here is um, the proportion of the population that has, so again, it's the proportion of the population with K kids, of which B are boys, okay? But basically, it works the same way as before. And zeta is the premium on being a boy. So, what you might wonder is, well, how does this uh, relate to the other kind of favoritism that we had earlier on? Because you could have both kinds of favoritism, the boy premium and the firstborn premium. Um, how does it work? If you take the extreme boy premium, so the boys get everything, the answer is really very simple, very unjust, but very simple. Basically, uh, it becomes just like the basic model that we had earlier on, but it's just, it's a boys only model. Otherwise, it's the same, everything's the same. If you've got extreme firstborn premium, whether or not you've got gender bias, we find that shrinking zone of the idle rich, the Pareto tail moving off to the right, and basically you get this uh, Pareto tail disappearing. Okay. So that's irrespective of whether you've got gender bias. Marriage. Now... I will admit that the formal presentation of the results becomes much easier if you assume uh, a sort of mating. But we're going to appeal again to uh, popular literature to give us uh, a lead into how we can relax that. Um, many would say, well, actually, a sort of mating is possibly on the increase in places like the United States but it would be reasonable to have a more general approach. And to do so, we will appeal to the Brothers Grimm. Okay, so Grimm's fairy tales. One of the Grimm's fairy tales, of course, that's very well known is The Prince and the Shepherdess. For equal representation, those who object to that uh, Grimm's fairy tale, I would refer you to the comparable um, story in Hans Andersen, which is where it's the princess and the shepherd, all right? So it works either way around. The basic point is this. In the uh, Prince and the Shepherdess, you've got uh, a rich male marrying somebody who's uh, poor. So let's call this class disloyalty, a parameter delta. So everybody um, either marries up or marries down by a factor of one plus delta. And would you believe it? Again, you get a Pareto tail. It's just that the formula for beta becomes that little bit more complicated. We get this modified uh, condition for alpha. And you can check, if you really want to, that this collapses back into the standard case if uh, 
the um, delta is equal to zero. But what's kind of interesting here is to see how important um, class disloyalty is, because if we just simply, sorry, I can't draw a nice straight line there. Uh, let's just forget about that, shall we? If you just, for example, look at point nine or whatever it is on the, on the just to fix our attention on there for beta, and simply cast your eye upwards vertically from there and look how alpha increases. We move up from delta equal to zero, which is strict assortative mating, to delta equals 0.2, where everybody's marrying up somebody 20% richer than them or 20% poorer. Uh, delta equals 0.5, you know, 50% richer. And look how alpha goes up, inequality goes down. Okay, exactly what you'd expect. So basically, if, for example, um, the status quo were delta equal to one. Um, so everybody marries someone who's either twice as rich or half as rich as they are. Then the switch back to strict assortative mating, see some advanced societies like the United States at the present moment moving in the direction of assortative mating, it's going to have the same impact on alpha and therefore the same impact on inequality as a rise in the growth factor, beta, from 0.9 up to 0.95. It's quite substantial. Now, for my French colleagues here, I have a little treat. We're going to talk about the French Revolution. Um, and the reason we're interested in the French Revolution is I'm sure you have gone through every one of the pages of uh, the giant Piketty tome will know, is that... Uh, it provides an interesting study in what might happen if, at a stroke, you change inheritance practices. Because one of the things that exercised the revolutionaries was that there were clearly procedural injustices and outcome injustices you know, in terms of what uh, pre-revolutionary France. And the revolution was going to enforce procedural equity embodied in the Napoleonic Code, and this guy, the Marquis de Condorcet, in his many influential writings, we all know about Condorcet voting and all the rest of it, um, said the following. Beware the first four words. Never write these in any article you write. It is easy to prove that fortunes naturally tend to equality and that excessive differences of wealth either cannot exist or must promptly cease if the civil laws do not establish artificial ways of perpetuating and amassing such fortunes and if freedom of commerce and industry eliminate the advantage that any prohibitive laws or fiscal privilege gives to acquired wealth. Well, there are various uh, hints in Piketty's book that uh, the French Revolution remains a bit of a puzzle because, um, shock horror, wealth inequality did not disappear in France. And we might think, well, was this a failure of the Napoleonic Code? Um, possibly not. What we'd like to do, or what I'd like to do now, is a couple of counterfactuals that dear can I through. So on this diagram we've got, again, it's alpha versus beta. So all of these curves give you the same story as before. You tell me what beta is in terms of the growth factor of wealth, and then you read off on the vertical axis what alpha is, which is the, um, Pareto, the Pareto parameter for the upper tail, therefore the inequality in the upper tail. All right? So again, using some wonderful data that Dirk dug out, we can look at what the equilibrium distribution was in pre-revolutionary France, and that's curve one, okay? Now we ask ourselves, what would have happened given the, you know, when the French Revolution occurred there at the end of the 18th century and the, moving into the early 19th century, we know how the population structure in France changed, 
we haven't got wonderful data, we've got some data. What would have happened, what's the counterfactual, if the French Revolution never happened? <laughs> okay, you go there. So for any beta, you have a much lower alpha, much higher inequality. But what actually happened after the revolution was that it moved in this direction to distribution three. Okay? Which perhaps was not quite as exciting as the revolutionaries had hoped. Now, why wasn't it as exciting as the revolutionaries had hoped? You'd look at the change in French society. It's all a problem. It's all a little emperor problem. By the way, this has nothing to do with Napoleon. Um, they, you know, people used to call him the little emperor. The little, this was um, a slander put around by British propaganda. Napoleon wasn't actually unusually short for the time. Um, you work it out, he was actually about uh, median height. Um, so this is an early example of fake news. But So it's nothing to do with the... <laughs> it, he may have had small hands, I don't know. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's nothing to do with Napoleon and his code. It's to do with the rise of the little emperors in France. And basically, if there hadn't been... So there's uh, the... Um, this was... Counterfactual number one, what would happen if the French Revolution hadn't taken place? Counterfactual number two, what would happen if the French Revolution had, did indeed take place, but there wasn't the rise of the little emperors? We would have moved out here. So there would have been even more uh, equal society than we would have had otherwise in terms of the equilibrium distribution. Uh, by the way, if both things had happened, you would have moved to distribution five so that the primogeniture thing wipes out the effect of uh, the little emperors. If you want to know how tall Napoleon was, it was 170 centimeters. We move on to the policy implications of all this. So, as I mentioned in the introduction, it's not just tax policy, because other things can have the same impact as uh, introducing a tax. Let me just indicate to you why inheritance tax, certainly in Britain and uh, probably many other countries too, doesn't have a great press. If you look at um, the proportion of tax revenue raised by different taxes, so here the, uh, the big uh, solid red curve uh, over the years uh, refers to uh, taxes on property. Uh, the, the curve right at the top is taxes on income. You know, there's, there's not much coming out of it. If we look at, and I've switched to percentages for some strange reason, but if we look at all property taxes, a um, variety of countries there have put in Canada, Sweden, uh, the US, um, as well as the UK. Again, um, there's not a huge proportion there. If we look at just wealth and wealth transfer taxes, again, we're looking at uh, somewhere between 3.5% uh, uh, down to as little as uh, half a percent of total revenue being raised by that. And if we um, look just solely at wealth transfer tax, again, there seems to be this terribly tiny proportion. So you find people on the right saying, get rid of it. You know, I mean, it's not doing anything. It's raising this tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of total revenue. And so, you know, we want wealth cascading through the generations, but wealth cascading through the generations unchecked is a disaster. So why? So if you're talking to your right-wing friend in the bar later this week, how does it work? So you say, well, okay, it doesn't raise much revenue. And we know from works of... Uh, Pestieu and others that uh, there's very little in terms of an efficiency case for any kind of wealth taxation for or against. But there is a good equity case. So the false argument is, well, look, you're not raising much money. Therefore, you can't be doing much redistribution. But you come back to Professor Joe Stiglitz and pre-distribution in this case, equilibrium inequality, and wowee, look what happens. 
So now I've just turned the diagram around a bit. So we've got Gini on the left-hand side because that's what everybody knows in, in terms of inequality. But Gini is just simply 1 over 2 alpha minus 1 for the upper tail equilibrium. Beta along the horizontal axis. And I've taken the, from the previous examples we had there, sort of a moderate amount of distribution uh, of families by size, a moderate amount of dispersion. And you can see what's happening here, that if uh, we had... Uh, no taxes, then uh, in this model, you'd have somewhere a little bit over a Gini coefficient of around about nearly 0.32. Introducing a tax at a rate of 10% brings the equilibrium Gini coefficient down to 18%. What's going on here, if you work through all the little formulas you had leading up to the equilibrium distribution, is that in effect you're reducing the size of beta. Okay, people carry on saving at the same rate as before in the Scob Douglas model. You've got the same growth rate of underlying wealth, but every time a generation pops off, the state says, I'll have some of that, and they grab 10%. Not a huge tax rate in terms of... Uh, way inheritance taxes. So, but there you are. You can read it off the screen, the, the, different, the different tax rates and the resulting equilibrium inequality. Of course, it depends on the size distribution of families. So if we've got more little emperors, we've got a more spread out uh, distribution, similar to what we had before. Um, take the same case as before with uh, the original beta. So now the before tax Gini of the rich is uh, 35%, and we introduce a tax rate of 10%. The after taxes, uh, Gini is 20%. But it's not all about tax. Supposing, again, we've got Gini on the left hand side, um, beta along the horizontal axis. Suppose we had a government that wanted to influence the size distribution of families. Everybody thinks of China and the one-child policy. Uh, think also of uh, India in times past. You think of other countries as well. Or it may just be that social convention suggests, you know, the thing is to have smaller families than we used to. So you imagine what would happen if social policy were such that instead of a case three distribution, the blue solid line, uh, that, sorry, that's the curve corresponds to case three. Um, we had the case two distribution of families by size, which then has much more compact distribution of families by size, fewer little emperors, but fewer large families. You see that the relationship between Gini on the left-hand axis and beta shifts downwards so that for any growth rate of wealth, you end up with a lower equilibrium amount of inequality. So basically, that change, if it were introduced by some kind of family policy or whatever, if we take the case of beta equals 0.9, which is what I did for the previous examples, it would increase alpha, the Pareto coefficient, from 1.9 to a bit over 2.1, which means a reduction in the upper tail Gini from about 36% to around 31%. So a few takeaway thoughts. I've longed to write those words. Condorcet was wrong. <laughs> because basically, even in the absence of unfair laws, even in the absence of unfair customs like favoring one gender over the other, or favoring the firstborn, or favoring whoever under old colonial or uh, ancient Egyptian rules, it doesn't matter even if we did all, all the way that. Inheritance drives inequality through the mechanism of families. You didn't think of the family as an inequality generator, but it is. Even if the family is highly egalitarian amongst the kids, scrupulously observes the treatment of boys and girls and all the rest of it, and the older children, the afterthought children, and the young children, you know. There you go. 
a surprising omission from many models of wealth distribution is the labor market, not all, but many of them. And in this case here, it's got an interesting interpretation because in effect, it becomes a cushion. So that if it so happens you do badly out of the lottery of life because you know, your parents had a lot of kids and you don't end up much in the share out, you can always work and the next generation can bounce back. We know that inheritance generates Pareto, it's almost always true, except in a very strict, strict, strict interpretation of primogeniture. But it's not always the same kind of Pareto tale because where it starts depends on the particular structure of your model. And if you uh, want a very simple condition for equilibrium, you know, I told you to remember the parameter beta, it's got to be less than pi, which is the growth rate of, the, sorry, the growth factor of the population. Also, the inheritance uh, taxation case is clear. And that's it. <laughs>